Three weeks ago in New York, journalists were summoned to this hotel for a press conference. It's been organised by this man, Ali Reza Jafarzadeh, an Iranian exile who regularly reveals what he claims is inside information on Iran's nuclear program. I'd like to share with you today the information I've gotten from the very same sources that had proven accurate in the past. Today, Jaffa Zadeh announces he's discovered an apparently <coughs> sinister new development. A very important aspect of the Iran regime's nuclear weapons program is actually laser enrichment. And the information I've gotten from my sources today suggests that Iran is heavily involved in laser enrichment program something Iran has told always, the IAEA the that they have abandoned details. any of such programs Maps, names and, addresses. and they don't have it. And Since 2002, um, Jafar Zadeh and the Iranian opposition group he's connected to, the Mujahideen al-Haq, or MEK, have made nearly 20 intelligence revelations. In press conferences from Paris to New York, Washington and London, they're scheduled to be able to get the bomb by 2005. The MEK revelations have had an extraordinary impact, sparking inspections in Iran by the nuclear watchdog, the International Atomic Energy Agency. According to the MEK, Iran is building a nuclear bomb and the world should be very afraid. I think the world has to take the Iranian regime's threat very, very seriously. These Ayatollahs believe in, in what they say, believe that they can eliminate um, Israel um, off the map. They can eliminate um, um, uh, the superpowers. According to this Iranian opposition group, there is only one solution. You need to slay the dragon. This is the solution. You need to slay the dragon which means regime change. The MEK is playing a key role in what's shaping up as one of the critical contests of our time, the standoff between the United States and Iran. Played out here at the United Nations General Assembly two weeks ago. Iran must abandon its nuclear weapons ambitions Outside the United Nations that day, Ali Reza Jafazadeh and the Mujahideen al-Haq are again trying to get their opinion heard. Obtaining the bomb, the nuclear bomb, would unquestionably give Tehran the upper hand in the region. And some powerful forces in the West are listening. The MEK's main backer in Washington is a newly formed think tank called the Iran Policy Committee, headed by a former Reagan White House official, Professor Raymond Tanta. The regime change clock has to start. Right now the regime change clock is not even ticking. In the Iran Policy Committee, Professor Tanta has created a powerful grouping of former CIA, Pentagon and White House officials. One among which is the Iran Policy Committee. At forums like this briefing on Capitol Hill, the group is trying to convince the American government that the MEK can help them achieve the goal of regime change. We didn't choose the Mujahideen il -Khaq. The data hit us between the eyes, the analysis passes what I call the interocular test. It hits you right between the eyes. I invented that phrase. <laughs> but for some, the sight of exile groups bearing gifts of intelligence for the West just brings back bad memories. In the past on Iraq, 
we were fed a lot of false information to try to get our attention and to get us to do what we did. We bought it. And I have a very hard time understanding how anybody can maintain a straight face and say again that we should do the same thing all over again. Professor Gary Sick has served on the National Security Council under three presidents. He was the principal White House aide for Iran during the Iranian Revolution and hostage crisis and has followed the country closely ever since. He's extremely sceptical about the MEK. When people get enthusiastic about this, I just have to look at the history of the organization, the way it's behaved, the way it's, it's done, it, all of the things that it's done, and I simply can't see it. I really can't see it. I, you know, I, I find it very difficult to explain why people would get so enthusiastic about this group. The MEK does have an extraordinary history. A militant left-wing movement, it participated in the 1979 Iranian Revolution that overthrew the Shah. But afterwards, when the Ayatollahs took power, the MEK began fighting the new regime. It carried out bombings that killed senior Islamic leaders and many of its members were executed. In the 1980s, it moved its military base to Saddam Hussein's Iraq. From here at Camp Ashraf, it launched attacks across the border and successfully carried out assassinations and bombings within Iran. The MEK's military heyday has long since passed. Less than 3,000 fighters remain in a camp now guarded by Americans. What's more, the group's often violent past has left it officially listed as a terrorist organisation in the United States, the European Union and Australia. The real action for the MEK now is in the West, where a bevy of lobbyists is operating, including Ali Safavi here in London. Safavi has devoted most of his adult life to the MEK struggle. Now he's working to get the group taken off the terrorist list. His office located around the corner from Parliament. And uh, obviously the office is very close so that uh, it would be more uh, convenient both for us and for them. Being listed as a terrorist organisation stands between the MEK and real political credibility. Safavi claims the group was only put on the list by governments trying to win favour with Iran. It has nothing to do with the nature, with the conduct or the activities of the Mujahideen. Uh, it is uh, basically a, a bargaining chip. Ali Safavi is trying to convince the West of the apparently impressive democratic credentials of the MEK and its political wing, the NCRI. The NCRI basically advocates a secular democratic form of government, a, a, a government that is based on the separation of church and the state, or mosque and the state, if you will. Leading the concerted charm offensive is the group's leader, Mariam Rajavi, who's based in Paris. She's offering up an enticing proposition to the West. Aujourd'hui, je suis venu vous dire que la communauté internationale n'est pas obligé de choisir entre des mollas avec la bombe atomique ou la guerre. Il existe une troisième voie, un changement démocratique par le peuple iranien et sa résistance organisée. Mariam Rajabi says if the MEK is just taken off the terrorist list, it will be a sign for the people of Iran to rise up and overthrow their government. It's this proposition that's winning support with the Iran Policy Committee in Washington and in parliaments around the West. Here at the European Parliament, 
British Conservative MP Brian Binley tells a group of MEK supporters that the majority of the House of Commons and 130 members in the House of Lords are behind the group. Because they are the antithesis of the dictatorial fundamentalists that rule in modern day Iran today. And indeed, the very antithesis of a regime that I believe poses the greatest threat to global security that we face as a global people. Finley was converted to the cause after being approached by an MEK supporter in the halls of parliament. I met with a, a gentleman called Nasser, who, who um, is a supporter of uh, the National Council. And uh, we talked, and he works in and around the house uh, uh, as, a, as a lobbyist, I suppose you would say. And we talked, and I liked what he had to say. And more importantly, what he had to say seemed credible in the way that I've just explained. These are people who really believe that Iran that regime should be changed, that this regime of mullahs should be done away with. And you look around and you don't see any other place where you can put a lever. And the, I must say for the Mujahideen, to give them full credit, you know, they're very good at their propaganda. According to Gary Sick, the MEK's origins at the time of the revolution were anything but democratic. You know, there, too, I mean, they weren't talking about democracy. They, they were talking about power and who took over. And uh, uh, there was no, certainly no sign from where I sat in the White House that these people were in any way trying to bring democracy to Iran. They were trying to get rid of the group that had taken over and install themselves in power. And I think that pretty well describes what they've been doing ever since. Masoud Hordebande says that the MEK is not only undemocratic, but that internally it operates like a cult. Now living in the United Kingdom, Hordebande was a high-level member for more than 15 years. They have a charismatic leader. They use psychological methods to convince people and keep people. Their wealth is always serving the leader not their people. They try to get the money out of the people and keep it. They cut people from their past, their family. They, they are very restricted in that way. Uh, is Mariam Masoud and uh, me as his bodyguard. The picture was a support. Hoda Bande worked as security for the MEK's leadership in Iraq, but left after becoming disenchanted. He's now one of the most outspoken critics of the organization. Later on, it uh, came to these sessions of self-confession, which again is a cult. Uh, every cult has got it, which you have to come and every day come to the meeting, explain what you have been thinking about or what even you have been dreaming about. And uh, even if you don't have, they would hint that you have to lie. You have to make up something. So the collective pressure would be on you and they purify you. So all women wore headscarves? Yeah, it was part of the uniform, it's actually the uniform. That's another... Masoud Hordebande's wife, Anne, was also a member for seven years, this is me. inspired to join by an Iranian boyfriend and an interest in Islam. I became full-time in 1990. After going on hunger strike for, for two weeks, I was in, on a real high and I devoted myself to them. Um, and that devotion was, was encouraged and I was told at some point fairly early on that all you have to do is choose your leader and follow that leader and you don't have to make any decisions. Now that leader of course was Mariam Rajavi. Both Anne and Masood say that in order to encourage devotion to the leadership, family relationships were discouraged. When it comes to actually being a liberating movement for women, I would say just the opposite, opposite pertains, that they forced women to separate from their children, they forced women to divorce their spouse, um, they forced them to uh, give up any thought of having a normal family life and a family relationship, even relationships with their 
siblings in the same organisation are, well, banned, really. Um, you, you might meet them, but you cannot be a sibling with that person. You can't show more closeness to them than you would show to Mariam Rajab. The MEK leadership totally rejects these allegations and accuses Masood Hordabande of being on the payroll of Iranian intelligence, a charge he in turn denies. An even more serious allegation, though, concerns the group's relationship with Saddam Hussein during its 15 years in Iraq. This recently revealed footage shows Masood Rajavi, the husband of Mariam and co-leader of the MEK, with the former Iraqi dictator. The Mujahideen were forced to relocate in Iraq. And in the years that they were in Iraq, from 1986 onwards, they were completely independent of their hosts, both in political terms, in ideological terms, in organizational terms, and in military terms. So there was no collaboration between the Absolutely, and absolutely Saddam not. In fact, when you talk about... However, many sources, including the US State Department, dispute this, saying Iraq supplied the MEK with weapons and received military assistance from the Iranian exiles. Religion. Former member Masood Hordabande says that after the first Gulf War in 1991, Saddam's security chief, Taha Yassin Ramadan, asked the MEK to help suppress the Kurds. The way that it was done, I remember that in the meetings uh, with uh, Taha Yassin Ramadan, which was in favour of Mujahideen, and it was very much praised the Mujahideen for their loyalty. He divided the forces because he didn't have much forces after the war, 91. So he had only enough to suppress the uprising in the south. So he left the north in the hand of Rajavi. Masood says he saw firsthand a Kurdish village that had been destroyed by the Mujahideen. What had happened to the village? It was just flattened down. The whole village, I mean, you have villages in Iraq, a small village, and then say 20 tanks. You can see how, what, what damage can it be done. But it was deliberately flattened. And this I was mean, done was by, by the Mujahideen? By the Mujahideen. They were, they were there when I was passing the tanks and victoriously uh, celebrating. Masood also says that during his time with the MEK, its members were fed a diet of anti-imperialist and anti-American propaganda. He believes now they're trying to reinvent themselves for a new Western benefactor. Especially when they went to Iraq, they didn't see that one day Saddam would fall. So they have openly been anti-Western all the years that they have been there, relying on Saddam. Any sort of democratic face that they put is, uh, is, a, is a false face. What, why do you think they're putting on this false face now? There's no other choice. After Saddam falls, there is no other choice if they want... The MEK denies this aspect of its past. It says that anyone making such allegations is being either directly or indirectly influenced by Iranian intelligence. It is far more than a bit of a propaganda campaign. In fact, the Iranian regime has spent hundreds of millions of dollars in engaging in propaganda. In Washington, the MEK's main American backers also reject any criticism. We are familiar with all the allegations and we've looked at this, these allegations and we found them to be baseless. And we're smart, we're not idiots. You know, I'm a professor at the University of Michigan and the Georgetown University and I think I can tell whether a person is saying something to, to dupe me. And the Human Rights Watch and various others who've said that, that the Mujahideen al and the National Council of Resistance of Iran are changing their face in order to appeal to groups like the Iran Policy Committee haven't done the research. While the MEK and its supporters say there's nothing in its history to be ashamed of, experts say that's not how it's viewed in its homeland. They are certainly despised. There's no two ways about that. Uh, they are seen as turncoats. They are seen as traitors. Uh, people who joined the, the Iran's enemies uh, to try to 
to uh, overthrow the government. For a group claiming it can make the Iranian population rise up and overthrow the government, this apparent lack of internal legitimacy is a major problem. So how much support do you have in Iran, in numbers? Well, you know that our movement from day one has called for free elections under United Nations uh, supervision. If such an election were held, without question, uh, our movement would get most of the votes. The claim that the MEK would actually um, win any support or win any elections inside Iran is really preposterous. Dohi Fasahian is the former executive director of the National Iranian American Council, a non-partisan group. She spent much of the 1990s in Iran and knows the political scene well. In fact, um, they are hated and detested in Iran um, because of their role in siding with the Iraqis during the very, very long and bloody Iran-Iraq war. Um, and so I would say that more so than even Iranian Americans, Iranians inside Iran uh, really do hate the, the MEK and, and really don't understand um, why um, some um, governments and some um, officials abroad um, can support such an undemocratic group um, and such a violent group. Political credentials aside, the strongest claim the MEK has on Western attention is its intelligence on Iran's nuclear program. How good are your sources, your intelligence from Iran? Well, the intelligence is the best that exists and uh, anywhere. Um, the best track record in terms of intelligence regarding Iran comes from the sources of the Mujahideen Khal and the NCRI. It wasn't the intelligence community of the United States or Britain or other Western countries that discovered Natanz. The MEK's biggest claim to fame has been its revelation in 2002 that Iran had a secret nuclear site at a place called Natanz. After the announcement, the International Atomic Energy Agency confronted Iran and Iran opened the site for inspection. So I think the Iranian opposition group, what they did, their real contribution was to start a chain of events where Iran had to admit that it had a secret gas centrifuge program and other, and other secret nuclear programs and help get the IA into Iran to start uncovering um, a whole set of, of misleading statements or uh, hidden facilities in Iran. Now this building was sized to hold a thousand centrifuges. It could actually hold more. David Albright is a physicist and president of the Institute for Science and International Security in Washington, D.C. He's an expert on secret nuclear weapons programs throughout the world. While he credits the MEK with bringing Natanz to the world's attention, the site was not in breach of a non-proliferation treaty. Albright also says later revelations have not proven as useful. Since then, the record's been a lot more mixed, and 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 uh, a lot of revelations, you know, things going on at, you know, making related to making nuclear weapons. Um, I went to one place and found nothing. There was some f equipment they, that was imported. They said was you know related to nuclear weapons. It turned it was it turned out on analysis, it wasn't even suitable for use in a nuclear weapons program. So I think the you know you have to sort of read beyond the detail and try to make sense out of it, and often it doesn't make any, or or it's just speculation. Dateline also understands that the International Atomic Energy Agency has examined much of the intelligence provided by the MEK and its political wing, the NCRI. And while it agrees several early claims were on target, the rest have been unreliable. All their revelations paint a picture of Iran having an incredibly advanced nuclear weapons program. Would you agree with that assessment? Well, it's, it's, it's relative to what? I mean, compared to Iraq, 
which had nothing yet, it's quite advanced. Um, are they close to building a bomb? I mean, most assessments, including our own, our own, are that no, they're not. No one knows whether the revelations are true. So how could someone make a statement that the NCRI MEK revelations are off? Intelligence people say this, but they don't back it up because journalists don't do a good job in querying them. Say, what is your evidence? Oh, I can't say. Hello? That's not right. But, but, but by the same token, how can, if the NCRI holds a press conference saying, look, we've got these documents, we know this information, and there's nothing else to back it up, how can you be sure that that's true? Look, intelligence is an art. What you need is to use the MEK NCRI revelations as lead information with which you compare with information you acquire independently. But if revelations are being made and they're not proven and they're being put out there in the media and put out there as a case for regime change and they're not actually substantiated, isn't that alarmist? How do you prove revelations with a totalitarian Islamist fascist regime? The MEK knows that hardliners in Washington are desperate for any information that will confirm their suspicions of Iran. So if the MEK is trying to get credibility as a group that will be uh, able to, that, they, that the United States should cooperate with in trying to overthrow the regime, focusing on the, the nuclear side is an absolutely logical place for them to focus. So I, I don't blame them for doing that. I think that that's that's an area that is going to attract attention, it's going to get them a following, and it will actually attract the attention of people in Washington. According to former member Masood Hordabanda, the MEK is just trying to stay alive. They want to survive. They are saying that take us off the, the end game is that take off, off the list of terrorism and use us. And in a clear convergence of interests, Professor Tanter from the Iran Policy Committee is happy to help. I'm not a lobbyist for the MEK and the NCRI. I'm a lobbyist for America, which is different. So you, but you keep asking me questions which imply that I'm trying to push the MEK onto people. But, but you're promoting their cause. You're trying to get them off the terrorist list. No, I'm not isn't it? promoting their cause. I'm promoting, promoting American interest. There's a difference. You're not suggesting that the Mujahideen is necessarily a good replacement government. You're saying rather that they are a good tool for, for Western interests. That's what point. you ask me. You know, they're, they're, they're a tool for Western interests. Yes, they are accused of being a tool of Western interests by the regime. It's true. And they are a tool for Western interests. Yes, they want to be a part of the West.